Woo! Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just real quick, um, we're coming up at the end of the series. Um, we've been going since February 20th, every Monday night, so almost about 20 weeks. Um, I think it's been a pretty good success. We got about one more week, one more next week, and then we'll be done for this series. Um, next week will be Sean Finkel. Sean Finkel is doing actually like a psychedelic frequency and like music performance next week. Yeah. I think it's a good way to end the series off after a lot of educational talks. Um, and then now we are officially a 501c3, a nonprofit. <laughs> That's great. Tax exempt. <laughs> um, let's see. So yeah, again, we want to thank Meraki Kava Bar for allowing us to use this space every single Monday night and for Alana's hard work each Monday night serving all of you guys. And hopefully we can do another series like this next year. And, um, so tonight's speaker is Gary Smith. He's a leading authority on psychedelic law in the U.S., advising companies and organizations on drug laws, public initiatives, and religion. He is the general counsel for the oldest multiracial peyote church, and is a legal consultant for several cases. He's talking about the peyote church way of God in southeast Arizona, right? Southeast? Um, he is also a proponent of the Uniform Plant and Fungi Medicine Act, which seeks to create state-level regulatory structures for certain psychedelics. He is a prolific writer and speaker in the field, having written the legal manual, Psychedelica Lex, and hosting the Psychedelica Lex podcast. He is also a founding member of the Psychedelic Bar Association and a board member of the Arizona Cannabis Bar Association. And we all welcome Gary Smith. <laughs> Just real quick, I have this set up with the camera here because uh, for those of you who may know me already, I do have a podcast, as Adam mentioned. So I'm hoping to turn tonight into a podcast. I'm not pointing the camera back at you guys, so don't worry about privacy. I will not point the camera at you, but it's going to stay on me. Um, is the light annoying? Because I kind of need that to film, but I can turn it off if you don't want it on. You're good. Okay, perfect. And how's my voice? Can you all hear me okay? Do I need the microphone or no? Okay. Turn up the volume. Yeah. Oh, the microphone. Did it, did it. I wasn't even talking into the microphone yet. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, also, uh, I brought with me kind of an extensive PowerPoint, um, which I would like to use during the presentation, which I know sucks because the stage is there, but the screen is there. So if everybody would like to just kind of come this way, or you know, stay where you are. But in any event, the show is on the screen here, uh, and I will talk over it as we go. Uh, other things to know, I've got, I guess, about an hour for the presentation, a half an hour afterwards for questions, but listen, I know this stuff already, so I'm here for you. Don't hold your questions. You can ask anything you want at any time you want, any topic at all. Uh, if I know the answer, I'll give it to you. If I don't know the answer, I will definitely make some shit up, uh, <laughs> which is my long-winded way of saying don't trust anything I say. Uh, anyway, so with that, let's sort of dive in a little bit. So, of course, thank you to... Adam and Phoenix Psychedelic Society and Phoenix Psychedelic Club. Um, I was, yes, we've already got a question. I haven't even started yet. Go ahead. Okay, all right, let me tell you what. I'm going to sort of put my butt in the seat a little bit. Can everybody see me okay still? Can you hear me okay now? Yeah. Is this better? Yeah. All right, so I'm going to put the microphone right up to my mouth. Ah, it's like a present. Okay, so uh, anyway, thank you uh, for inviting me. I have been sort of uh, chased over the last couple of years now to come and do something for you guys, and I've just been so hellaciously busy, so I, I wanna give kudos to Adam for being persistent, because persistence pays off, and here I am. Uh, also, thanks to uh, Meraki Kava Bar. Uh, I've had Kava before, but I haven't had it here before, so Woo! thanks for hosting. Uh, and I think I'm drinking something with Kratom and Kava both which makes for a fascinating flavor profile. <laughs> but if you've ever had peyote, that's still way better. Okay. Show of hands. <laughs> okay. All right, so a uh, couple just quick uh, little disclaimers here. Uh, I am a licensed attorney. I'm gonna be talking about law stuff today, but I wanna be crystal clear. I am not your attorney. This is not legal advice for you guys. You shouldn't be walking out of here saying, but Gary said. No, Gary's here for information only and for entertainment only. 
If you do have actual legal questions, I encourage you, of course, reach out to me or another licensed attorney, but have those conversations in private. If they're personal to you, don't vet them in a public setting. Uh, so for today, again, ask me anything you want, but try to keep your questions kind of non-personal and more general for your own protection. Uh, also a reminder, we're gonna be talking about psychedelics, which of course is schedule one. That means generally they are illegal, they are generally forbidden unless you fall into certain discrete exceptions, of which there are many, and we'll talk about some of them today. Okay, uh, Adam did a pretty good job introducing me. I won't say much more other than I'm 30-ish uh, years now in law practice, uh, born and raised on the East Coast, uh, just outside of New York City. Um, couldn't get out of there fast enough, so I left immediately after college, headed west. Uh, in that time, I've racked up four different bar licenses, a bunch of different credentials. Uh, amongst things on my resume include, I'm a, uh, well, I'm a practicing attorney in four different states. I'm also an arbitrator and mediator with the American Arbitration Association, uh, founding director of the Arizona Cannabis Bar Association. I've been doing a very vigorous cannabis practice for, oh, I guess we're in our 13th year now, uh, since, uh, yeah, since before 2010 when uh, our medical marijuana program got started. And by the way, for those of you who don't know, that was the second time Arizona passed medical marijuana. Um, do you know this? I'm getting a lot of no's. Okay, good. Yeah, in 96, Arizona actually did pass a medical marijuana act. And the legislature, within months, killed it. And it went away as a result. And the people who ran that initiative to get medical marijuana passed were so upset at what the legislature did that they went and ran another public initiative to modify the Arizona Constitution to insert what we call the Voter Protection Act, which stands for the proposition now that the legislature, for the most part, can never um, impair or tamper with any public initiative other than by supermajorities in both sides of, of our legislature and then, of course, by signature of the governor. And if you've been following politics, I don't know, for the last 50 years, you know getting a legislature to get a supermajority on anything is almost impossible. So resultingly, uh, we, in 2010, had medical pass. In 2020, we had recreational pass. And our legislature, be aware, would love to kill both programs if they could. They can't. So it's by grace of this public initiative that we have it. Um, anyway, uh, other stuff about me. I do a bunch of psychedelic stuff in my cannabis work. I just am one of these people who likes to know a lot about my topic. So over the last 12 or 13 years, I've just been doing intensive reading and studying, trying to learn more as I can about plant medicine. And that inevitably bumps you into psychedelics, which it did with me. Uh, I was not raised in a hippie household. This was not a normal thing as I was growing up. Uh, but I encountered it and, and just fell head over heels in love with the subject and found that every time I, I looked at another issue of psychedelics, 12 more issues popped up. And it didn't matter what you were looking at. It could have been art, history, law, literature, music, culture, you name it, psychedelics, it's everywhere all the time throughout human history and beyond if you are just paying attention. Um, anyway, it just grabbed me, fascinated me, and I've been neck deep in it ever since. So resultingly, I ended up, um, well, starting the podcast, but before that, I um, authored this little monster, Psychedelic Alex, which is, to my estimation, the first legal treatise that's ever been written, certainly in the United States, if not in the world, on the law of psychedelics. And thank you. <laughs> Anyway, I wrote it from a lawyer's perspective, but I tried to write it with the average person in mind. There are some sections in it that admittedly are kind of dense and heady, but it's written for any level. So if you have not uh, gone to college or, or more than that, I think the book is still accessible to you. So I would encourage if you're interested in the topic, give it a look. Are you selling those today? Uh, no, today, you, you lucky, lucky people, I'm actually gifting some of these uh, on condition, you ask good questions, but I will give one to whoever asks the worst question, too. Because uh, that's got value as well, don't we know? Um, unfortunately, I only have one copy of Psychedelic Alex with me, so somebody's going to have to ask a really good question to earn it. But separate from that, I um, had scraps left over when I was writing Psychedelic Alex, and a year later, I decided, what the hell, let's give Arizona the treatment, so I wrote and published Psychedelic Arizona, which is kind of a tchotchke whimsical tourist book about all things psychedelic connected to Arizona. And as I was finishing this off, I was shocked at how many psychedelic connections Arizona has. So I've got a bunch of these to give away today. And then um, I'm giving Brian Murarescu a plug because he deserves it. Uh, 
um, I was telling somebody earlier, a couple Christmases ago, Brian put this book out and I bought a box of them to give away as holiday gifts. I thought that much of it. Um, anyway, Brian is, uh, I can't even like match his educational level. He speaks five different languages, Latin, ancient Greek, crazy stuff. And he got access to Vatican records and did deep research into, uh, well, I don't want to give too much away, but the origins of psychedelics and humanity's connection to it. And that's as much as I'll say, this is one of the best reads I think I've had in at least a couple of years. So I got a couple of those to give away as well. All right. So enough about me. Let's talk psychedelics. Nope. Now, let's finish talking about my stuff first. <laughs> Shameless plug. They are on Amazon. So if you're not getting one for free today, there is a second shot again. Okay. So. When Adam reached out and asked me to talk to you guys, I thought I was gonna be going to the MAPS conference in Denver a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I just got too busy work, I couldn't go. So I had absolutely nothing to tell you about Denver other than I understand like the week they were gonna host the MAPS conference, there was a big shooting in Denver. So I missed that, that was a plus, uh, but I didn't get to go. So resultingly, I can't tell you anything about it. So instead, I created a smorgasbord of topics just to kind of give you guys a little intro into a variety of different things that are going on. That being said, again, if you guys have questions on anything, don't hold them back, hit me with them. Anything yet? Okay. Yeah. How soon do you think we'll have legal, a legal pathway for psychedelics in Arizona? A legal pathway for psychedelics in Arizona? Well, from a certain perspective, we're gonna have it probably in the next year. In the form of FDA approved psychedelics, which is part of my slideshow. Yeah. Uh, yes. So I was listening to one of your talks a few weeks ago, and you were talking about the legality of going to do a 501c3, how that's going to be more complicated. So I'm assuming you'll be addressing that? Um, that's not on my list of stuff today, but I can address it if you have yeah. particular questions. Yeah, I just uh, want to know why it would be more complicated to go a nonprofit kind of route. Uh, okay, so a 501c3 is a type of nonprofit, but a 501c3 is a tax designation issued by the IRS. And there are extremely <laughs> arcane rules that you have to follow. The, the organization has to behave a certain way, use its money a certain way, be structured a certain way, have certain enumerated charitable or educational purposes that are designated in the code. And of course, the IRS will check out on these things. And if it doesn't match what you're really up to, you've blown your designation. Um, I will tell you this much, 501c3 status, to get it is so specific and unique, I don't do that practice. I know other lawyers in town that I refer that work to because that is exclusively what they do. Um, when it comes to stuff that technical and with tax, everything is technical, you never want to go to a dabbler because they will screw it up and it will cost you. Um, you will, when, for tax stuff, you always want to go to a specialist. All right, anything else or should we dive into topic number one? Everyone's happy? Okay, anybody need drink refills? Uh, 12 seconds to get it? No? Okay, cool. All right, so uh, let's talk about the state of licit medical and industrial psychedelics. So the question a moment ago is, when are we going to see this in Arizona? Well, Australia beat us two weeks ago. They got there first, uh, and they have now made available MDMA and psilocybin for certain uh, psychological conditions. Um, this is just right where the U.S. is about to be. We're about a year off from seeing both MDMA and psilocybin, and, and, and Europe is also as a block looking at this as well. Um, kudos to Australia for going first. It's a good portent because it helps to push it along in other countries. Yes, you have an arm up there. Yes, I just had a question about your thoughts on if you think it's going to be decriminalization as a pathway to legalize it here, because in Australia, I'm assuming that it was just medical. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, the, the Australia program is just medical. So that, that's a great question. Let me lay some premise down for the rest of everybody here to uh, grasp the nuance. So what I'm talking about right now, just in this part of the seminar, is strictly only having a drug go through a, a governmental regulatory agency and get approved by that regulatory agency and then also be approved for um, compounding or, or, or submission by a pharmacist as well as being allowed to be scripted by a physician so that you can go uh, and engage in it. That is what is happening right now in the world relative to MDMA and psilocybin. As far as that industrial, you know, go to your doctor experience that we all have and, and do. Separate from that, for sure, and more slides coming in a little bit, there are some states, Oregon and Colorado, that are now looking at this question from a completely different angle, where they're saying, yeah, never mind the medical stuff, 
this is something beyond medical, it's something more than medical. So um, both Oregon and Colorado have now decriminalized many of these psychedelics so that it's not in a criminal track anymore and you don't have to go to a doctor necessarily to get it. But hold that thought because more slides coming on that topic. Um, now, I said a moment ago, we're just kind of behind Australia. They got there first, but MAPS, we've all heard of MAPS. Um, they have been attacking the question of MDMA now for, oh golly, since the 80s. So, you know, 30, 40 years. And they're on the cusp, they're at phase three. There are three phases of study needed. And uh, they are about to have MDMA be approved, I think, within the year. Remember, it was once non-Schedule one. it was pumped on Schedule one, and now they're trying to pull it back off and they're gonna succeed. Um, separate and apart from what MAPS is doing with MDMA, and by the way, they're not the only ones out there doing it, there are a bunch of other companies also researching with other substances, and in fact, uh, pulled up one on Compass Pathways, you may have heard of them. Uh, they tend to draw a little controversy because they're aggressive with their patenting, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but Compass is moving towards getting uh, psilocybin, which is also at phase three, approved for ultimate um, availability through normal medical pathways. Uh, now, I mentioned that uh, Compass kind of gets a, a bad rap for being aggressive with its patents. So why is any company out there looking to get into psychedelics? What's in it for them? Um, same as with anybody trying to get into any business, money. Uh, it, it may be, maybe, maybe there's some outros in there, maybe. Uh, I kind of doubt, no, there's no outros in there. It's all about money, let's just be honest. It's money, it's money, it's money. Uh, why are they doing this? They're doing this for money. And they're doing this in a way that lets them make money. You'll notice that none of these companies that are out there trying to produce any of these psychedelic substances for availability are doing it in its natural form. Why? Because you can't patent anything that's natural. You can't go outside and say, ooh, oak tree. I'm gonna patent oak tree. You can't do that. Oak tree is already oak tree. You don't get to grab it and make it your own. Patents come about through creation, invention, something new. So these companies are saying, okay, I'm gonna take this naturally occurring molecule and I'm going to either synthesize it in a way that you don't find in nature, that's patentable, or I'm gonna add an extra carbon here at the end or a carboxy here at the end, and now that's not natural, it's man-made, so I can patent that. That's effectively what they're doing. And when they have this patent, they then have the ability to have exclusivity over that thing they patented. If I go and register my patent on this microphone, I and I alone get to exploit it financially. If you wanna use my microphone, I get to charge you for it, or you don't get to use it. That's what they're doing. They're saying, hey, we've got these molecules, we're making them unique, we're making them ours, we're gonna control them exclusively, and now we're going to exploit them for money. And make no mistake, to get a drug passed through all the things you've gotta do for FDA for approval, costs in the tens to hundreds of millions of dollars. It's insane what it costs to get a drug approved. And resultingly, all these companies are expecting to get reimbursed for all the monies they spent all this time investing and studying and getting this thing approved. And of course, they're gonna to wanna to profit on top of that. So anyway, that's what we're seeing right now. That's what's coming up the pipelines are these, air quotes here, normal drugs that you're accustomed to seeing from your pharmacies and from your doctors, and that's what they're gonna to try to turn psychedelics into. Uh, but there are problems with that. Hold that thought, we're coming to it. All right, so. Meanwhile, our federal government is aware that we've got a terrible mental health crisis, and SAMHSA is uh, a sub-agency of uh, Department of Health and Human Services, and they sent a letter last year warning Congress that this seismic shift in, in mental health treatment is coming because of the seismic shift that's coming in psychedelics, because as soon as psychedelics become available, most psychotherapists, most psychologists, most psychiatrists are going to want to look at that and possibly integrate it into their practices. It's game changing. Uh, but we have no track record with this yet and most people don't know what to do with it. And so, you know, we've got agencies saying, Congress, pay attention because this is gonna be a massive cluster mm -hmm. uh, if we don't plan ahead. Hand up. Yeah, but just curiosity-wise, but Portugal, legalized drugs back in, I don't know, decades ago. Yep. Is, is there any kind of studies they've done there with psychedelics? Because I don't see a lot about it, but it seems like they, they would have. And so um, can we use some of that, those statistics to help with this? I mean, yeah, it's, it's, I'm not specifically aware of uh, Portugal studying psychedelics specifically, but you're right. Uh, Portugal is one of the few nations in the world, and um, certainly in Europe, 
where most drugs, they just don't have criminal laws for anymore. They've decided to treat it instead as a social issue as instead of a criminal issue, which I think is vastly more enlightened. And, and you'll notice Portugal hasn't snapped off of the continent and fallen into the ocean. It's still quite attached, and there are still people walking around who identify as Portuguese, and they look reasonably happy. Uh, so, you know, probably, yes, there are statistics that are tracked. I don't know what they are. But yes, absolutely, statistics tracked all over the world are critically important. In case in point, the United Nations, because of the illicit drug trade, is rabid about gathering up this data from all the different countries that are members of the United Nations that report, because there's a whole drug wing of the United Nations. Yes. It's a very big part of what the United Nations does, actually. You would think it's really mostly about preventing war and giving a platform to uh, have nations talk and hopefully avoid war. but. That war bit is actually just one slice of what the UN does. Um, in any event, our government kind of slowed the uptake. Okay, so if we're not gonna have medical for a while and we're not inclined to be medical, maybe we don't have a mental illness or we're not gonna be wanting to go to a mental illness practitioner for our psychedelic moment, then what else is available to you? Religious use and exemption. Um, that's a place where I dwell, that's a place where many other people dwell. And it's, well, as the Associated Press article that I uh, grabbed the heading from, uh, it's exploding right now. There are tons of people interested in psychedelic religions because of a variety of different reasons that range from the obvious, they're interested in psychedelics, to the slightly less obvious, they are genuinely interested in religion and a religious experience, but whatever they were brought up with or had experienced to this point in their lives just wasn't working for them. So there are a lot of people out there exploring. And then there are a lot of other people out there who just aren't naturally religiously inclined, but spiritually inclined, which is absolutely perfect for psychedelics. If you've ever had the experience, you know. Um, so yeah, interest is drastically increasing. And unfortunately, we've got police issues that tie into this, and the police are not well attuned to it. Um, and why is that? Well, a couple of things. First off, we've got First Amendment protection. And in fact, there are many, many, many court cases, uh, all the way up from the US Supreme Court down to local state courts that have supported the concept of psychedelic religion. It's not across the board forbidden. Uh, it's just difficult to establish with a court that you're legitimately at religious purpose. And where the problems really uh, occur in the day-to-day -day experience is typically with the importation of psychedelics into the country. And we have, uh, unfortunately, that clash because of Schedule One and the DEA. So the DEA is responsible in part for monitoring the US borders and the drugs that flow across it, but they also enforce internally uh, to prevent the diversion of drugs. So they're not merely concerned with its importation, but also its manufacture and where it goes. So if you are a typical uh, pharmacy that perhaps is importing drugs from out of the country, you know, you're gonna fill out your DEA forms, there's all sorts of slips and manifests and things you sign, and there's nothing wrong with this, it's a perfect normal part of commerce, and you'll, you know, get your materials from the lab, there will be a paper trail that starts from its source of origin through customs up to wherever it is that you are storing it at your pharmaceutical facility, and the DEA is gonna have rights to go in and inspect your facility and make sure you've got all the right locks on the doors and the right cameras and protocols for safety and security, because again, they're concerned with in part, improper diversion. So, you know, you see this a great deal with uh, fentanyl right now. You know, we've got so much fentanyl spilling over the borders, it's going everywhere, and it's a very dangerous drug. So the DEA is very focused on fentanyl these days, for good cause. Uh, but other things get caught up in it, and one of these things is, for example, uh, ayahuasca churches. They, uh, ayahuasca right now, by the way, the number one litigators in the psychedelic world, and thank God for them. So. If you ever have opportunity to donate to a psychedelic uh, church, uh, choose an ayahuasca church if they're doing litigation because they're doing hard work for everybody's benefit. Um, but here's the clutch. You've got the First Amendment that says we, in fact, let me back up a slide here just to make the point. Two main clauses, the, the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause stand for the proposition that the federal government can't make a religion, so you'll notice there's no federal religion. We don't all, you know, worship, I don't know, Uncle Sam. Uh, and they also can't impair the free exercise, and that's really where DEA bangs into uh, psychedelics. 
is the free exercise. So generally, whatever your religion says, you're generally okay to do whatever that religion says. But when you bang into criminality uh, is where criminal authorities can say, hey, wait a minute, your religious exemption is not infinite. There are limits. And usually when I give seminars, the example I give is this. We could start today, all of us. And in fact, let's take a vote on it. Who wants to start with us today a, um, a religion that's focused on cannibals? We, we can do that. We can absolutely have a cannibal religion. We can extol the virtues of cannibalism. We can talk about how wonderful it is, pray to our cannibal god, have our cannibal holidays, which probably don't include fasting. Um, and that's fine. There's no prohibition against any of that. We can even talk about cannibalism. But the moment we're like, hey, let's eat Dave, that's when it becomes a problem. So yeah, if you're, if you're gonna eat Dave, that's when the law is gonna step in and say, okay, religious exemption really isn't infinite. And I think at that point, especially if you're Dave, you're like, you're goddamn right, religion is unlimited. So there are limits. So that, that's where the DEA banks into this. So now you need to understand also, the DEA is a police agency. They don't have religion people on their payroll. They don't know anything about it. And you also have to think of how offensive it would be, for example, if the police were to come into your Catholic church and start busting you because, oh, you know, you missed church last three Sundays, so you can't possibly be a good Catholic. You'd be offended by that, right? Same thing with the psychedelic religions. I saw a hand up in the back. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, a couple of things. Dave wouldn't complain if Dave were dead. Um, but I'd also have to ask, uh, we're a cannibal religion. How did Dave get dead? Because there might be another problem there, too. And then, of course, there are prohibitions against eating dead people. So, um, yeah. But it's an interesting thought. Maybe Dave could later consent. I don't know. Put, hey, one of you put in your will. You won't be around to actually see if your family eats you, but you can leave a message. My final wish, eat me. <laughs> hey, he said that while I was alive. He meant it differently then. All right. So anyway, like I said, Arizona is ground zero for this, this psychedelic litigation. Um, we, and, and point of fact, not only is it going on, but uh, the one on the left here, and my laser pointer will not actually show up on the screen. Are you kidding me? Okay, my finger pointer works great. My laser pointer does not. My cat loves this. Uh, but anyway, um, the Yahweh Assembly is um, doing ceremony again. You know, they are one of the uh, churches that's in litigation right now. And then um, otherwise, the Eagle, Church of the Eagle and the Condor is also in litigation right now. So two Ayahuasca churches here in Arizona, both suing DA right now as we speak. Uh, but they're still carrying on ceremony. Uh, but in Eagle and the Condor uh, is instance, for example, I think they've had uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm saying it backwards. Um, the uh, the Yahweh Assembly did have some criminal entanglement, which is why they are now in this lawsuit, because they're trying to make their point that everything they were doing was appropriately under religious exemption. Uh, but yeah, and here you go. Here's, I grabbed just a page from the federal docket. This is from some months ago. There's been more activity on it. Uh, in fact, um, Charles Carrion, who's one of the lawyers on that case, he's based out of New Mexico. Great guy, um, he's very approachable, so if you ever wanted to reach out and talk to him, I'm sure he'd appreciate the conversation. Um, but that's what's going on, and what they're fighting with DEA about is just this, this pain in the butt that the churches have just importing the ayahuasca. The DEA stops it at the border every time, takes it, confiscates it, and says, eh, no, no exemption for you. Meanwhile, they have no regulations written at the federal level that instruct DEA how to figure these things out. So. I am hoping what comes out of these lawsuits is going to be a modification in DEA's behavior. And I'm somewhat sympathetic to them because they didn't get good instructions. So it's confusing for that agency and they need better instruction to do their proper function. And I think it's coming, I think it is. Yes? Yeah, I'm wondering, is the, the content of these lawsuits, is the prosecution pretty much focused on proving that they violated technicalities of the law or does it get more philosophical about what should be legal and criminal? Um, no, it's more the technicality. You know, the DEA, being a police agency, kind of tends to see things in a black and white world. You know, crime, no crime. And, and what they're saying is, ayahuasca, crime. Uh, they have no sense of flavor of nuance for the exemptions that are uh, permitted under First Amendment. So that, I think, is at the heart of the problem. It's not the question of the illegality of ayahuasca. The DEA has already you know, made the pronouncement that it's Schedule One. Not much you can do about that. Um, and this is also part of the problem. So I have a few slides on why this religion thing is difficult. 
So, show of hands, can anybody give a concise, agreeable definition to religion? Anybody? Hint, no. Uh, not even the courts can. It's, it's, it's just a mess. And if you go and look at all these different cases across the country in both the federal circuits and in the states, it's kind of this just spray of concepts and nobody has a good agreement on what that is. And it's not well-developed law. So I can tell you a few things like there's case law that stands for the notion that there's no such thing as a religion of one. So I can't say I'm just the Church of Gary, screw you. Um, if I'm in front of a judge at my criminal trial trying to defend my drug possession because I'm a church of one, I'm definitely going to jail. I know that. Um, but there are other things that courts look for. Hand up, yes? What if there's two Gary? Well, you're the other one, so I'll be blaming you, and then I will go home and you will sit in prison. Thank you. I was going to say, if, if a religion is, it only counts if you made it up a long time ago. Well, no. Okay. Okay. So age matters. Okay. You're making me jump ahead to another slide here. So, okay. This is going to be the Meyer slide. This is a, a, a district court case out of Wyoming. So it's not even top level federal law necessarily. This is just one court in Wyoming that kind of got it a little right. And a bunch of other courts have since followed it. And it's called the Myers case named after a guy named Myers. Uh, who got uh, into trouble for his church of marijuana and lost, by the way, there is no church of marijuana, not with legal exemption. Uh, but yeah, Myers lost, but the result was that the Myers decision looked at all of the existing uh, court cases that had come down leading to that point and grabbed all the little bits and pieces that it reasonably could and said, okay, let's, let's stitch all this together into an interesting, what I call the, the religious bingo card. And if your religion or your behaviors hit enough of these bingo card numbers, well, congratulations, you won religious bingo. So here's what the courts are looking for when it comes to religion. Because I'll tell you, in my law practice, I get calls all the time with people who just want to do drugs, and they want to tell me it's a religion, and they start asking questions, and there's no religion there at all. Uh, so I have to give them bad news. So here's what courts are looking for. Religions have a number of things. They look for ultimate ideas. What is existence? Why am I here? What is here? What am I? The imponderable stuff. Um, they look for metaphysical beliefs. You know, what is the nature of the universe itself? You know, you're not going to get that in your ordinary schooling. Um, they have moral or ethical systems. They, they establish what is right behavior, what is wrong behavior. Um, they have a comprehensiveness of belief. Uh, they don't just believe just one thing, but they have a whole spate of understanding of whatever it is they understand. And think of all the different religions you know. You can find these tendencies to some degree or another in them. Um, and then, then there's the accoutrement of religion. Uh, they're looking for, you know, is there a founder or a prophet or a teacher? And by the way, if you have a founder, um, you, you might be in a cult. Um, they look for important <laughs> items. They, they, you know, do you have scripture? Do you have anything written down at all? Uh, believe it or not, there are some religions that don't write stuff down. It's an oral tradition. And in fact, most of the world's religions at one point weren't written down. Uh, you know, early Christianity wasn't written down. They came together hundreds of years later and said, we should probably document this. Um, gathering places, do you have a place where you get together and worship or are you just a religion of one? Um, do you have keepers of knowledge? Are there people who are considered to be elders or repositories of knowledge and secrets? Um, do you have ceremonies and rituals? You know, you may or may not. Um, do you have a structure, an organization, literally a corporation? Do you literally have a corporate entity back in hell? Um, do you have holidays? Do you spend any days worshiping or looking at different questions or things? Do you have any particular dietary habits or do you engage in fasting? Kind of tip to our uh, cannibal religion. Um, appearance or clothing, do you have any special garments you wear? Um, you know, many religious groups have particular special garments. Uh, and then propagation, are you trying to expand your religion? Are you out there proselytizing or, or trying to get more people in? Um, and just on this accoutrements of religion, you can think of religions you know that don't necessarily even do all these things, like propagation, for example. Judaism does not proselytize. You will never meet a worshiping Jew who's going to knock on your door and try to invite you into the religion. It's not what they do. But a Jehovah's Witness will knock on your door all day long. Um, is one more religious than the other? I doubt it. Is one a religion and one not? I doubt it. But, you know, these are the different behaviors a court has to look at. So, you know, what I typically tell clients when they're calling me and asking me about this stuff is, well, you want to have as much of these check marks on your religious bingo card as you can, because if you're ever in front of a, a judge at your criminal trial having to explain this all the way, 
you want to hope you can explain it all away because you don't want to go to prison. So that's the religious exemption, basically, of uh, psychedelics today. And by the way, again, I remind, I'm not doing deep dives on any topic, I'm just trying to uh, expand your knowledge. So understand, everything I'm talking about here today, I could take one topic and spend a week talking to you, we'd still never hit it all. Um, so what else is going out there in the world? So if we can't have religion, or we don't want religion, or don't need religion, what else is out there? Well, Oregon uh, just engaged its psilocybin program. And um, if you're taking a look at the screen, and you should, um, yeah, just look at those yeah. prices. Just yowza, yeah. right, right, right? And for those of you in the back who maybe uh, need glasses or can't see, um, $3,500 for a four gram mushroom session in Oregon. Yes. Yeah, okay, so that's part of it, but that's not Oregon's fault. What you're talking about is Schedule, or excuse me, um, IRS Regulation 280E. So um, for those of you who, by the way, anybody here work in the cannabis industry? I used to. Used to, okay, all right. Uh, you may know this, for those of you who don't work in the industry, there is this draconian tax code provision, IRS Regulation 280E, 280E. Uh, which was enacted during the 80s to combat the cocaine cowboys that were coming in uh, mostly through Florida. And what 280E stands for essentially is that any business engaged in the trafficking of Schedule One drugs cannot, as a part of that business, deduct any of their ordinary business expenses. So for example, if I'm running a kava bar, I get to deduct the rent, the electricity, the staff salaries, the um, you know, equipment that we consume day to day. The cannabis businesses or any business engaged in, a, in an illicit, illicit Schedule One, they don't get to deduct any of that. So every one of those dispensaries around town, they are paying effectively three times the tax you are in your businesses. It's hellacious. Um, so yes, that is definitely part of the pricing, but really uh, the big part of the pricing is all of the infrastructure that's layered on top of this poor, innocent little mushroom. So Oregon's program is all about the natural, unrefined mushroom. They're not using some funky synthetic psilocybin that's coming from one of these medical companies because the Oregon program is not a medical program. It can't be. It's an uh, experience program is what I will call it. Um, but uh, for those of you who are familiar with psilocybin mushrooms in particular, you know it literally grows in shit, right? <laughs> Yeah, for real, I'm not, I'm not kidding. It's, it's okay. <laughs> what's the term, coprophilic, I think? Um, no, it literally grows in shit. You can grow it in other substances, but out in the wild, it grows in poop. It's as cheap as cheap can get. So how does something that you could pull out of a turd suddenly become $3,500? <laughs> um, and the reasons for that are that the program has layered on top of that poor, innocent little mushroom a bunch of regulations that require a bunch of staff and observers and real estate and insurance and all of that stuff costs. So I'm not shocked in the least at what these programs numbers are showing. Uh, and I think I've got a slide next that also, yeah, okay, I do that. So two days ago, I was um, just tooling around on Reddit and I just saw this one post and I thought, this is the one to show you guys to explain why $3,500 for a four gram mushroom trip in Oregon. Um, somebody posted on Reddit, and the tool <coughs> cut off, but they're saying, hey, I, I tend to have violent tendencies. If I go do this trip, am I going to, like, wig out and hurt people? You might. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, these facilities are thinking about that, too. So, you know, why is it this much money for an experience? Because you've got people there keeping an eye on you. And they're there for hours, and you're there for hours. So, you know, your <coughs> typical experience there is going to be four to six hours, because they're not gonna let you take a mushroom and jump in your car and drive home. They're gonna wait until you're back at baseline and save the drive, because the liability risk for them is tremendous otherwise. So they're gonna be super careful, and resultingly it's expensive. Um, but this is also why I think we need to get ahead of this question, because I have been saying for years now, these sort of grassroots programs are very, very welcome, very needed, but they are revealing a truth, and the truth is not everybody is going to want to or qualify to go to this future illicit medical path only, 
because listen, if, if, if this Oregon program is revealing these are the prices, do you think your doctor's office is gonna do better? They're gonna be way more expensive. And maybe, maybe if you're lucky, your health insurance company will eventually catch up and embrace psychedelics and cover some of that expense. But again, remember, we're talking about a mushroom that grows in shit. Do you think $3,500 is paying for the mushroom? It's not. It's paying for all the stuff surrounding the mushroom and you getting that mental health service. So um, what I think this is ultimately revealing is the black market once illicit psychedelics come online and normal people start to realize this is very helpful and I can get it much cheaper elsewhere. Yeah, that's what's coming. So I, I, I think the state needs to get ahead of it and just embrace some sort of program that's non-medical that makes it accessible at a reasonable price. Because if not, people are gonna gravitate towards it on their own. And now we're off to a black market again. Um, anyway, so that's Oregon did Measure 109. That's how they created their program. And then side part of that, uh, a year ago, Colorado uh, passed a, a natural medicine law, which is even more liberal than Oregon, because amongst, in fact, let me pause for a moment, I've got a comparison slide here. Uh, how am I doing on time, by the way? Uh, 57, but you got time. Another 20 minutes or so. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so I don't know if everybody can see this, but I did a little compare and contrast slide so you can get an idea of the differences between Oregon's and Colorado's program. Basically, the big differences are this. Oregon's program is psilocybin only, although Oregon did pass separately a different law that made some other substances decriminalized. Um, Colorado, right out of the gate, decriminalized a bunch of stuff, um, allows for individual possession, use, home cultivation. Uh, Oregon does not. Oregon requires that you go have your mushroom experience at a psilocybin center. Only the centers can cultivate, grow, possess, and administer. Uh, and you gotta go there. So yeah, if you wanna be in Oregon and have a mushroom experience, 3,500 bucks. Uh, if you wanna have the same experience in Colorado, probably 30 bucks. Um, but you know, you're doing it on your own, you're sourcing it on your own, or you're getting it from a friend. Um, Colorado does not permit any sort of uh, financial trade, so you can't open a business as a drug dealer. <laughs> you'll just be a drug dealer, uh, and you'll be in serious trouble for that. And there could be no like and kind remuneration. So you can't get cute and clever and be like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna give you this uh, pile of mushrooms for this $50 t-shirt. Nope, you can't do that. It's gonna be transparent. People will understand you're really selling the mushrooms. So have to be careful out there. But I am appreciative that both states are doing this. These are great experiments. I kind of predict Oregon's gonna fall flat on its face and either <laughs> that program's gonna get scrapped or have to be majorly modified. Uh, Colorado, I predict, is a little more stable because it's more grassroots and just more on the individual. And I think as long as people behave respectfully and don't do crazy, stupid stuff in public, it'll be fine. Um, and at least in my experiences, most folks who are in a psychedelic universe don't tend to do crazy stuff in public. It's the other drugs that people tend to do crazy stuff. Uh, but I'm optimistic. So is this coming in Arizona? I don't know. We can talk about that at another another seminar because I am trying to advocate for some sort of a national model state level law that every state could just grab the same thing, run in their legislature and get it passed and have it be uniform so that it's predictable, it's easy, everybody can embrace it, that it embraces things like uh, reasonable public safety while allowing reasonable access. Okay, so Arizona does have a psilocybin law now, but now what do you think it is? Um, the closest we're getting, but this is a terrific sign, is um, just a couple months ago, bipartisan no less, uh, we now have a $30 million allocation for the study of psilocybin here in Arizona. Um, now, the best part about this is it's the whole mushroom too. No other state's doing this. Everybody's sort of focused on these synthetic chemicals that are being put out, but Arizona's legislature, I'm shocked by this, I'm shocked to my core by this that they did this, uh, but they actually got it right. They, it, they understood out of the gate that the raw whole mushroom is where it's all gonna go. Because most people are not gonna be excited to go spend $3,500 in the doctor's office to get an artificial chemical when they can, well, throw it in a box of shit under their bed at home. Uh, it's just cheaper and easier to do it yourself. And I think what we're gonna see uh, is really, really, really good results that I think will make a difference because the legislature's focus on our veteran population, and we know we have one of the biggest veteran populations in the country. Uh, we also have some of the most challenged VA hospitals in the country. So I'm very optimistic. Um, it, 
you know Sue Sicily. Uh, she runs Scottsdale Research Institute. She's been on the scene forever doing cannabis research for veterans. Um, she has expanded into uh, now psilocybin. Um, and she is doing this research as well. I will also tell you that our um, psilocybin law requires that a board be appointed and on this board, mandatory, are supposed to be a certain people, including the director of the Department of Health Services. And you may know we're currently without a director. So the psilocybin program itself is temporarily stymied because of that. So if you are interested in this and you care about it, call the governor's office on occasion and let them know you'd like a DHS director appointed so that we can advance the psilocybin program. Um, but this passed, uh, I have the comment here on the screen, 15 to 0, unanimous. Democrats and Republicans vote. And the best news about this is that they're realizing this stuff is not a political issue, it's a human issue. And that's the face that needs to be kept on, on psychedelics as a whole. I think the moment it becomes political, you've lost it. So keep it neutral. Um, anyway, it's the House Bill 2486, if you care to go look it up, HB 2486. Um, yeah, near Scottsdale Research Institute. So this is Sue Sicily's uh, baby. And um, in preparing for today, I went and jumped on her website, and I didn't even know this. Uh, she's got a license now to manufacture for study, LSD, uh, cultivate mushrooms. She already had cannabis. And um, she's been working with MAPS uh, on MDMA for a while now, too. So uh, this is all cutting edge stuff. And by the way, I, I promised Sue I would tell you this as well. They're going to need tons of veterans for the study. So if you know any veterans that suffer PTSD or symptoms like that, have them reach out to Scottsdale Research Institute because they need test subjects for their cohort and it's perfectly licensed. So they'll have coverture and protection of federal and state law both if they participate. And they'll be doing something good for science. And by the way, this is uh, a clip from the Federal Register of Scottsdale Research Institute's application to cultivate psilocybin. I thought you'd be tickled by seeing that, so there it is, published in the Federal Register. Okay, and that brings me to the end of the presentation, so, uh, yes? Can you discuss the legal risk of buying spores online? Ah, yes, you had asked me that at the beginning, and I told you to hold that question, so thank you for remembering. So, yeah, the question is, what are the um, implications of buying spores online? So here's the crazy thing. Spores alone are not illegal because they are not psilocybin, they are not psilocin, they are nothing, they are just spores. All they hold is the potential to uh, eventually blossom into a mushroom. So the catch is the spores themselves, in and of themselves, are not illegal. They are shipped around all the time. And if you've ever ordered spores, what you're going to see because the spore companies are clever and they know what the law is, they're gonna send you a little information sheet that says this is for microscopy study only. And they'll even include little slides so you can put your spores on a slide and look at it on your microscope. Perfectly legal. Um, where you trip into illegality is when you take those spores and introduce them into a substrate with the intention of having them populate that substrate for the ultimate uh, production of mushrooms. So it's all in the intent um, and in the actual physical act. So if you're actually growing mushrooms, you have tripped into criminality. If you are buying spores with the intent to grow mushrooms, you have technically tripped into criminality. Beyond that, you know, all I can tell you is if you feel like you wanna order spores through the mail and trust that nobody's watching your mail and trust that nobody knows what you're up to, you can assume a risk if you want to, but technically, it is criminal. Other questions? Yes. Um, going back to, you were saying the psilocybin's getting synthesized, so they patent it. Yeah. What are they doing with MDMA? Because uh, it's not a naturally occurring substance. Yeah, that's, that's also. So has somebody patented already? Oh yeah, yeah, that's been patented for years. Okay. And you can take something that's been patented and you can modify that chemical again and create something that is once again patentable. I'll give you a, an interesting example. Um, so I'm assuming most of you have heard of ketamine. Okay, so ketamine is a surgical anesthetic. That's what it's approved for. It's so old, it's not even patented anymore because patents expire. You don't have them forever. They're good for only so many years and they die off. And the reason for that under the law is to encourage invention. 
So the reason you get a patent is basically to give you a reasonable window of time to recoup your investment in creating the thing, and then also a reasonable amount of time to exploit it, to profit from it, because there's nothing wrong with profit, um, but you can't have it infinitely. So patents eventually expire, and that's how old ketamine is. It's so bloody old, it's expired. But it turns out, over the years, that it's been found that it's kind of psychedelic and helps treat some mental health maladies. So you see these clinics popping up all over the place that offer ketamine drips or injections so that you can have this mental health relieving experience, even though it's off-label. So you might be thinking, wow, it's got this great extra use. Why isn't anybody rushing to patent it? Well, it's already fallen out of patent. And the only way you can get a patent on it brand new is to modify the chemical and then run a bunch of studies to get FDA approval as if you've started all the way back at the beginning, which means hundreds of millions of dollars invested in a chemical that's already widely out there and is being used off-label and being used generically. So who's gonna be excited to drop hundreds of millions of dollars into something that literally anybody can already go buy? Hence, we don't see ketamine getting repatented or modified again in a way that makes it patentable. Um, but psilocybin, on the other hand, has never been patented other than these new synthesized compounds. And here's crazy yet. Um, you can get a patent for these chemicals even though you can't legally sell them. They can be Schedule One, and you can still get them patented. You just can't financially exploit them. That answer? Yeah. yeah thank you. Oh, sure. Uh, you and then you. Okay. Yeah. So we have the, the was it the uh, American Native uh, American Indian Religious Freedom Act? Why? How are these? How is the government able to prosecute people like in the Native American Church? when they, belong, they, they seemingly have all the qualifications, or most of the qualifications. They, they had, it was the Supreme Court, I think it was a unanimous decision, they went to the Supreme Court in uh, Utah and they won the unanimous decision. Why is it so hard to combat these people with, you know, getting into the Native American church? I mean, that would qualify for most natural substances, wouldn't it? Um, okay, Why is that so successful? Your question is, Act with complexity. You may not. You may not know this. So, let me. Uh, no, it's a great question. It's a, it's a fantastic question. Part of your answer is subsumed in the fact that we're talking Native American church. Whenever we're talking Native, most things. This is a category unto itself under the law because of the various treaties that the federal government has signed over the two hundred and something years of the nation's history. Um, there are special carve outs under federal law. There are special protections under federal law that are unique. To natives and the Native American church. So that's part of your answer. More of your answer also includes that the Native American church generally has been a peyotis church. Right. More recently, you've seen some groups try to introduce some other substances into the mix. Um, I think the uh, Oakley Boyha had um, both peyote psilocybin. and psilocybin together. Um, and perhaps that is okay. It's just Remember I said earlier during the religion part of this, we don't have a lot of really well-developed case law. So these cases that pop up could be in part due to that lack of clarity, or it could be due in part to the introduction of things other than peyote, or it could be people who were formerly affiliated with the Native American church who have broken off to start their own thing. Case in point, the church I represent and belong to, the Peyote Way Church of God, right here in Arizona, has its lineage in the Native American church. The church founder was an officiant in the Native American church. And he had gone to the elders saying, hey, um, I see by federal law and also by practice, we have this uh, condition whereby you have to be so much percentage native to qualify to be a member. And my spouse is a native and that means my kids are not pure blooded and their kids may one day also be even less if they marry outside of the native group too. So um, I can see that I will eventually have my family breed out of the church. So I'd like to have some accommodation here for a more multiracial approach. And the elders at the time said, that's great, see ya. So um, he broke off and founded what is today the Anyway Church of God. It's been going great since the 80s. Wait, I thought I was on the impression that the Supreme Court ruled that anyone you, you can't discourage somebody from joining a church because of their race. 
no other religion has a race as being a counterpart, you know, Correct. A, a component of, of membership. So, and I thought that there was this a unanimous decision by the Supreme Court, if I was remembering my facts. Uh, you'd have to tell me the case. I don't. I don't know specifically what you're talking about. But when it comes to Native American church and Native American religion, again, there are federal statutes specific that give them a, a special carve out. They get special protections. Okay. Well, what, what, what is, I don't want to belabor this. But what prevents? Why have, have the religious exemptions failed against this? Uh, or against these criminals? The DEA. Why, why have they, they, they not been affected? What, what has prevented them? Have they gone to trial and they just... Yeah, okay, so... Says, no sure, way. sure. Okay, well, let's, let's talk the practicality of, of pursuing a religious exemption and why we don't see a lot of really well-developed case law. Um, how many of you have ever gone through the expense of paying for a complete defense of multiple felonies at state or federal court and then endured through the complete expense of your appeal following your conviction. Show of hands, anybody? Well, I did, but my, my, it was handled by the federal government. Okay, you didn't have to pay for it? Yeah. Okay, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars in attorney's fees and expert witness fees if you really want to mount a proper defense and end up going through a complete appeal to get an appellate ruling favorable to your issue. Uh, it's just as expensive as can be. I, I, I know that's a frustrating answer for folks, but the reality is so much work goes into a proper criminal defense. And if you're talking about uh, a case involving psychedelics and religion, you're having to bring in multiple expert witnesses to help bolster your defense because you're gonna have to have somebody talk about the religious implications and not just in the, in the concept of it. They're gonna have to look at your particular facts and convince a judge and a jury that what you're doing is religion and what you were doing at the time you were charged was in context of that religion, and that's expensive, time consuming. And most defendants either um, don't have good defenses or don't have the financial wherewithal uh, or the stomach, frankly, to take it on and, and run the risk of losing a trial. Because even if you come with your best day, your best evidence, your best witnesses, judges and juries get stuff wrong all the time. And when you're on the line and you're facing that risk of I could uh, take a plea deal and go home tonight, or I can roll the dice and spend $100,000 on trial and go to jail for 30 years. Yeah, most people get spooked and take what's behind door number one and take the plea. So we just don't see a lot of these cases come up that often, um, which is why the ayahuasca churches are really killing it right now, um, because they're dealing with the importation aspect at the border uh, although, again, in, in, in um, Guy Assembly's case, they did have a criminal charge associated with it. But they're arguing about just the, the civil stuff at the board. And it makes it easier. That answer? Good? Sure. Okay. Well, good enough. I wonder if you could speak at all to uh, where Canada is currently. Uh, Canada is north. <laughs> <laughs> and I think tomorrow it will still be north. <laughs> Because I, I just, from what I've seen online, they seem to have quite a, a large gray market. Yeah, uh, so Canada is always ahead of the U.S. on this stuff. You know, they legalized cannabis before us. They they actually have a stock market that will take Canadian stocks that trade in cannabis, uh, not the U.S. Um, they have softened their stance on psychedelics. I, I yeah, Canada is ahead of us. I, I don't know what else to tell you. Uh, it's just as simple as that. But as far as uh, they criminalize their uh, federal law, or, you know, the country law, or is uh, it for psychedelics to criminalize? Um, no, no, no. There, there are some jurisdictions there that have kind of relaxed their local laws, but federally there's a little more permissiveness, but um, not, you know, free from. It's not portion, put it that way. So you've been in the cannabis business, so they have a problem with banks, right? They can't. They can't handle their business the same way. Oh, their businesses yeah. Well, do, yeah. So. Yeah. So, cannabis banking here in the U.S. and this would be true, by the way, for any um, psychedelic business. So, the folks in Oregon are having this headache right now. The folks in Colorado are having this headache. <clears throat> ah, excuse me. Ah. Um, yeah. The problem is this: because psychedelics are Schedule One, we're talking an illegal product, 
and there are anti-trafficking laws, there are anti-narcotics laws, and banks, if they're taking your money, uh, can be accused by a federal prosecutor or a state prosecutor, uh, they can be accused of participating in the narcotics trafficking because they are handling the enterprise's money. So resultingly, most banks, and certainly the federally chartered ones, don't touch cannabis. So if you're ever wondering, like, gee, I keep going into the dispensary after a decade, sell to pay cash, why? That's why. Um, they just have a real hard time getting bank. There are state level banks, state charter banks that are a little more brave, um, but they charge outrageous fees because they know that they're taking a risk. So on top of these businesses paying, you know, this three time tax rate because of 280E, they're also paying exorbitant banking fees as well. Um, but make no mistake, the federally chartered banks, you know, the Bank of Americas of the world, would love to have cannabis. Oh my God. <laughs> they would kill for it, but they're just too bloody afraid to touch it. But the moment the federal law relaxes, trust me, all these little banks that have been having their fun time, those deposits are gone. By the way, I have been really bad about giving out books for questions. So let, me, let, me, let me remedy that. Who asked the best question so far? <laughs> okay. Well, let's do this. Okay, we'll save, we'll save one of these. We'll save one for last. We'll see who wins it. Maybe I get it. Maybe we'll save this for the worst question. All right. So you've been asking questions. You get a book. Oh. Would you like psychedelic Arizona or immortality? Uh, psychedelic Arizona. Okay. I I will I will say, in support of it. It's a good book. I wrote it. I would know. <laughs> Blessings. So, can I ask you a quick question? Hang on. Let me give a few right. more of these away, right. and then we'll do it. Uh, who else? You, you asked a bunch of questions. You want Immortality Key sure. or Psychedelic Arizona? You chose well. It's a really good read. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. All right. Ooh. All right. Which one, sir? I've already read Immortality Key twice. You All right. Well, this, <laughs> you'll be right. Right. Well, this one has lots of color pictures. So. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it doesn't help. <laughs> No, there, there's no, there's no Audible. No, no, no. By the way, the, the, the oh, um, immortality key could be on Audible. It yeah. could be. And by the way, I, it is on Audible. Is it? I, I will. I can't say enough good about immortality key. I, I really should send Brian an email and tell him to pay me for this. But um, no, Brian seriously. read it. Brian read it on Audible. Oh, he did his own. He pronounces the words correctly. So okay, that's that's. that's <laughs> no, 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 listen, you're, you're laughing, but you need to understand. Brian goes into a lot of ancient Latin and ancient Greek because it's just the nature of the book. Um, so yeah, to have him read it would make a big difference. So yeah. that's valuable, and it really is a fantastic book. Uh, okay, who asked a bunch of questions because I have more books to go. Well, I have one question. What investment would you recommend? Uh, how can we invest in that? Oh, I do not give investment advice at all. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Let me put it this way. I've been a cannabis lawyer now for, well, 13 years. I have never put a penny of my money into a single cannabis stock ever. Take that for whatever you think it's worth. <laughs> all right, who else? What can we actually do to help support and bring the law specifically in Arizona forward? Yes. Like, I don't know if decriminalization is something that we focus on. Yeah. And then the other question is specifically, are there and what are the implications of how Arizona is approaching the research and the laws around it being the whole mushroom versus like some of these other patented things? Okay, uh, that's a lot of more <laughs> Okay, so let, let's talk about um, getting Arizona to change. <clears throat> so, okay, you want to change the law. How do you do that? You either get the legislature to do it, or if you're fortunate enough to live in a state that allows for public initiatives, and we are in such a state, uh, by the way, and that is a rare thing, not every state has it. I think there are are roughly 30 states that have some form of public initiative, most don't, and um, most have provisions that allow their legislature to still tamper with public initiatives. Again, I mentioned earlier, Arizona's got this Voter Protection Act baked into our Constitution. So, let's talk practicality. Our legislature, despite what they just did by funding psilocybin research, is still very, very, 
very unfriendly to this stuff. So if expectation is you're gonna lobby the legislature to pass a law, uh, I am not so optimistic that's a good use of your time or money. I, I wish it were otherwise. So if you wanna remedy that and make it easier, here's my honest answer to that question. Run for office. I'm deadly serious. I'm not kidding around, guys. If you want to have the power to change the law, become a lawmaker. Um, we have not bright people down at the legislature. <laughs> it doesn't pay well. That's part of the problem. I think the legislature pays like 20000 a year for your service as a state legislature, legislator. Um, it doesn't pay well. So resultingly, the people that go after those positions either have the money already and have an agenda in mind, uh, or they're backed by people who have an agenda in mind. So if that's what's going on, and it is, why can't it be you? Why can't you be in that seat? So yeah, run for office and become a state legislator, and then you can change that law. The other way to go about it, which is the thing I advocate, and um, if you tune into my podcast, I've got several episodes where I talk about is um, a citizen-run initiative. Much in the way we got medical marijuana, much in the way we got recreational marijuana, they didn't go down to the legislature and say, would you please pass our law? Because the leg legislature would have told them to get lost. Instead, they ran a political campaign. So you've seen this twice in your lifetime already with cannabis. It's achievable, it's doable. But it means you're gonna have to run a political campaign and it means you're going to have to fundraise, and it means you're going to have to come up with some body of law that's actually capable of being passed. And I don't mean just, you know, it's written intelligently, but I mean it also would capture the imagination of the Arizona public, because that's ultimately what you're asking. You're asking roughly seven million strangers, our population is now over seven million in Arizona, but you're asking seven million strangers to look at your idea and embrace it as their own and take the time and effort to show up at the ballot box or to fill in their mail-in ballot and say yes to you. It can be done, but it takes time and money. Um, raising public awareness is absolutely the heart of this. So that's gonna mean people like you, people like me, coming out of the closet, so to speak, and being willing to talk to people who aren't like you and aren't like you know, here in this room, it's a safe space. We all claim to get the same idea. It's not a difficult topic for us to talk about. We're comfortable with it, and we know what it means. But we're still very much in the minority. And you've got to also think of it from the perspective of talking to people about psychedelics, there's an even chance they don't have a first clue. And if you've had a psychedelic experience and you're trying to explain it to somebody who hasn't, <laughs> do you even have the words? Because I, I struggle with it. Yeah. You know what, you asked probably the best question of the night so far, so you're winning this book. Um, but there's a chapter in the book where I talk about this problem. And one of the things that I, I mentioned is it's like trying to explain the color red to somebody who's never had use of their eyes. But you can, you can do a lot to explain the color red to somebody who's never had vision. You can tell them it's it's uh, wavelength in the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, it's associated with usually warmth and love and happiness. It's the color of roses and hearts and blood. And you can tell a lot about red. But is a blind guy going to have the first fucking clue what red is? No. There's no metaphor you can give them. They have no context. So that's the challenge. Is how do you have this conversation with people? who don't even have in their vocabulary of experience a metaphor that you can use to describe it. So you gotta overcome that. The first thing is just conversation. So start with a parent, start with a close loved one who you know is just not turned on any of this or is blissfully unaware and get them into the conversation. But yeah, I think a public initiative is the way to go and if people wanna start fundraising and putting together the campaign, count me in. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. So, so decrim alone, um, you know, 
in a long view, I think that is ultimately what the future could be or should be. Just decriminalize it, people will be people. I think jumping straight to that with no bridge in between is going to be dangerous. And my reason for it is this. Yes, I agree, ultimately decriminalization is the right way to go. But you're talking about a population that really doesn't have any experience with psychedelics in any meaningful fashion. And to suddenly say, uh, hey, four-year-old, here's the keys to the Ferrari, go. Um, there's a danger aspect to that. So what I personally would like to see is some sort of a bridge in time where we have some sort of a regulated environment so that we're at least assuring the average citizen gets a base level of education about this rather than just being chucked into the deep end of the pool. Uh, that would be my preference, just from a public safety perspective. Because I think most people openly would be open to it once they understood it, but I think most people don't understand it yet. Just to clarify the Colorado law, like in terms of cultivation and stuff and personal use, that actually goes beyond criminalization, right? It's actual legally there? Legally there? Yeah, yeah. Colorado is much more flexible than the Oregon law because Colorado will allow personal possession, personal cultivation. But it's an imperfect solution. So, um, quick show of hands how many people rent where you live? How many people's landlords are going to be happy knowing you have drugs on the premises? How many of you are going to be in violation of your lease if you have drugs on the premises? So, it's a great step, but it's an imperfect step because it still excludes a lot of people. All the way in the back. Hmm. So the District of Columbia itself did have an initiative on its ballot during the last election that deprioritized criminal enforcement. So they haven't made it legal there per se, they've just said that the police, that's like the last thing they're going to do. So if they've got literally anything else to do that day, they're not going to go bust and drug people. dubbing it legal. Um, if that were true, every edible you've ever encountered would have been perfectly okay always. Um, it's it's part of what people do to get clever. Like I mentioned earlier, people selling the $50 t-shirt for the dime bag of weed. You know, it's been tried. It can't really work though. What do you mean by a difference? You mean legal so status they, difference? Correct. Like, do they have to have, like, do they have different levels of protection for people serving at versus, or is it just one thing? Because I was under the impression that there are certain churches where you can become a member and be allowed to sit with the medicine, but not serve the medicine. Um, yeah, there are all different types of ways that psychedelic religions will approach the administration of the sacrament to a member. I think from the police agency's perspective or from a prosecutor's perspective, you're not gonna draw that much of a distinction. You know, you were there in the middle of what is a drug transaction, so was the person taking the drug. You're probably both gonna get charged if it's if it's an illegal activity. And by the way, I, I should I should say this at the outset. Uh, 30 years of law practice, I've never done a criminal case. I'm a civil attorney. I do lawsuits, businesses suing businesses, setting up businesses, that kind of thing. Um, I don't do criminal defense work at all. I know many people who do, and obviously I talk to them about it, but uh, it's not a mainstay of my practice. And by the way, I've got two books left, so, no, oh, sorry, I lied, I've got three books left, and the one holding my camera level, so four. So, congratulations, you won one. Who else? Who did I not get? Who else asked a question didn't get a book yet? <laughs>
any final questions? Anybody? Real quick. Yes, go ahead. So in all my research since the 80s and the readings and everything, I've never figured out why psilocybin has been ostracized, but Musimol from uh, Amanita's, Amanita Muscaria, yeah. um, is okay fine. Yep. And I've had bags yep. and bags and bags that I found out in Washington. Yep. And that was perfect. I could travel with it. Yeah, I have, I have never figured out why psilocybin got a bad rap, but Amanita did not. Because you're right, they're completely different chemicals, and Amanita's got at least as much history as psilocybin oh, does. Bourbon, bourbon. Um, and I've seen what happens to people when they've had too much of that. Yeah. They don't die. So, you know, it's nothing that's going to kill you either. Well, I, I, I don't know this for a fact, but I have read that you can you take a lethal dose of, yeah. of uh, yeah. Amanita. I was surprised that the young man did not yeah. take it in the wrong way. That's the yeah, uh, and there, there, well, there are ways to take everything wrong. I mean, well, you know, we're in a kava bar and have a kratom drink. You can, you can take too much kratom. By the way, this gets better tasting the lower you get. I don't know if that's just a <laughs> phenomenon. <laughs> that's weird. Yeah, it started off a little bitter. Now it's like getting sweet at the end. So I don't know if it's the drink or me or both. I don't know. All right, anything else? Anybody else? Okay, look, oh, better. Oh, my rant. I never did my rant. Okay, thank you. So we'll end on the rant. My rant is this, and it's a short rant. Um, psychedelic exceptionalism. Just say no to it every chance you get. Here's what I mean. So I've been uh, in the psychedelic lecture circuit now for a couple of years and making all sorts of friends all over the country. I've spoken to some people who are mentioning other lawyers they know who are friends of mine around the country. Um, and all great people, all good stuff. But what I'm finding is there are just little pockets of people and groups that are so focused on their particular belief about psychedelics to the exception of everybody else's belief. And I think that's divisive, it's, it's counterproductive, and also intellectually dishonest. And I'll give you an example, a real life example. So California has been flirting the last couple of years with this, this bill where they're trying to get a whole bunch of these plant medicines legalized. Uh, make it available individual level. And one of the items that was on the original bill was peyote. They were going to allow people to have and possess and cultivate peyote. And certain members of a, a Native American church group lobbied to get peyote ripped out of that bill, and they succeeded at it. And their arguments were, and I understand it and I do respect it, but you know their arguments were that this is a sacrament, and it's a literal embodiment of their deity, and it's offensive to them that other people would be engaged. Here's the problem. That's only true from their point of view. If you take their perspective literally, I would never be permitted to engage with peyote. Why should I be excluded? I'm offended by the, the suggestion that as an Anglo person, it's not for me. And I'm not saying this to denigrate the Native American church. I'm in full-throated support. I just don't believe that psychedelics belong to any one person or any one group or that they're any one thing. I think they can be medicine. I think they can be recreational. I think they can be uh, mind-expanding. Um, I think they can be a variety of things. And to try to pigeonhole and make them one and only one thing is just dishonest. And in a real-life example here, this sense of exceptionalism caused a bill to modify. And I take it personally for the reasons I've said, but then beyond that, there's another reason. Okay, the church you go. The church I belong to. Um, the church takes a different position. We support the idea that we want wide dissemination of payment, not because we want everybody using it. We don't advocate that at all. Rather, we're about protecting this very endangered plant, and this plant if you don't think about peyote, it takes 30 years for this little plant to grow to maturity. It's the slowest growing plant on the planet. And it doesn't have spines, its only protection are the little chemicals inside of it. And so human encroachment and climate change are beating this poor plant down. And it's probably legitimately endangered on its way to threatened. And nobody's doing much about it. So our perspective is, yeah, support it by getting into more hands, let more people home grow it because the more specimens around the world that there are, the greater the probability that this plant survives into the next century. Because look, people suck, we encroach into every environment we can, and we don't care what we tear up, and we don't pay attention, and climate change is real, it's upon us now, and this old cactus has only us to protect it. So 
you know, my rant. Psychedelic exceptionalism, just say no. Yes, ma'am. In my mind, if I were to write that law, I would I would say home cultivation, fine. Poaching in the wild, absolutely illegal, unless you got a special license for it, so that people aren't going looking for the ones in nature. Um, allow some level of remuneration, maybe not turn it into a business, but at least let people pay for what they're doing. You know, at least that much of an investment. Again, aimed at protecting the plant, not aimed at uh, fostering more consumption. Uh, but this is part of the problem because right now as awareness raises and people are getting interested in psychedelic religions, peyote consumption and other psychedelic substance consumption is going up, which means whatever limited supply might be out there in the wild is depleting ever faster. It's no different than the water table in the ground. You know, we're sucking out more than we're putting in, eventually you run out. All right. Thank you. Thank you. If uh, ever you want to invite me back, we could do a whole seminar on just how to start the grassroots movement, because I would love to get that yes. kicked off. Yes. Yes. All right.